that. I mean, I'll, I do the same thing. Okay. <laughs> you can still be social. But what I found after 10 years after publishing the Bulletproof Diet online and having people lost a million pounds on this, intermittent fasting was a part of it. Keto was a part of it. And don't eat toxic foods was a part of it. And I put it all together. So this is the ultimate. But what I found is that since then, people have fallen into this fasting trap, which is if some fasting is good for you, I'll do more fasting. And when you over fast, you end up not helping yourself. So it's sort of a Goldilocks zone of not too much, not too little. And it's different for women. It's different for men. And there's a spiritual fast, which is the whole context for the book, where I fasted in a cave for four days, led remotely by a shaman with no people and no food anywhere for 10 miles. And, and I, I write that story. But what about when you want to go to work and you don't want to be hypoglybitchy, which when I weigh 300 pounds would have described me perfectly. You want me to skip breakfast? I'll punch somebody, right? And how do we... <laughs> yeah, you definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do we show up... How do we show up in our life while fasting for our metabolism to become stronger? And then how do we show up on a weekend and fast for personal development? That's missing from all the fasting books. That's why I wrote it. I think that's absolutely wonderful and brilliant. And it's so needed because I do see a lot of people doing fast and they're not doing it the right way. And what's happening is they're fasting and, and then they're basically just causing a lot of more health problems in their body where they think they're actually getting rid of inflammation. They're creating more inflammation because of the stress that is, the body is undergoing. Why do you feel that people are not really aware of what it is that why, how come they're not aware that fasting is such a powerful way for us to, to up level our lives? There are these four F words that rule all life. And it's in order. And, and this is something that a bacteria has to be able to do. Bacteria don't have very big brains. They don't have any brains. So they can only follow really basic rules. And we have a quadrillion ancient bacteria powering us, kind of they're the, the puppet masters behind the scene. And the four F words that they follow are number one is fear. Run away from, kill or hide from scary things. Okay. And that gets 10 times more attention. It's because most things that we think are scary aren't scary. Just getting on stage and giving a speech is the number one fear of people in North America. However, you're not gonna die. It just feels like it. So we have this big response to be afraid of stuff that might be dangerous. And then we go to the next F word, which is food. And given that famine has killed most species over all of human history and before human history, we have in our bodies, in our tissues, a fear of starvation. And then you get these nutritionists from the 70s who say, if you don't eat six meals a day, you're going to, st you're going to starvation mode and you're gonna starve. Well, no wonder. I used to believe if I don't eat, I'm gonna act like a jerk and I'm gonna go into starvation mode, which is gonna move me from, from food and feeding into fear. And now I've got my 10X and my 5X focus on can I eat that donut? And it's just not okay. And so when you tell someone, hey, you should try fasting, it pushes all their fear buttons and their famine buttons. And the other two F words, just while we're talking about it, well, one is reproduction. Uh, and there's an F word for that that I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, I bet. Fertility, right? That's what you're thinking <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it could be the fornication word if you want to go there. But, but if we don't have that, it, it, we, don't, we don't have love in our life. It, it also, it, it feels like this vague hunger. And it is a hunger. It's a hunger of, of our tissues to make sure that our species survives. And it's okay to have that hunger. And the fourth F word that is behind everything that I do and it's the one that we do after the first three is friend. All species, if you're bacteria, you make yogurt or kombucha. If you're trees, you make a forest. If you're turtles, I don't know, was it a flock of turtles? Whatever, they, they hang out together. And if you're humans, you make a tribe, right? You make a community, like the one that you lead. And we are wired in our bones to be kind to one another and to support one another. But not if we're hungry all the time, not if we're afraid all the time, and not if there's no love in our life. And fasting lets you step out of fear mode and when you use the three fasting hacks that are in fast this way, you can actually turn off hunger. So instead of a fast being like work, you simply stop thinking about food. And here's the gift that I know will resonate with you because I know you well. 15% of the average person's thoughts every day are about what's for their next meal. I found a study of that. Now, if you can biologically turn off your cell's desire to eat, you get 15% more thoughts back. And if you're not digesting food, all the energy that went into breaking down the food goes into 
your, your thinking, your feeling into your being. And because you're not eating common toxins, like all food is a combination of energy in the form of calories, nutrients, things like vitamins and minerals, and things that are not good for you. And it's not like they're just one of the three. There's always a mix of the three. But if you're eating nothing that is bad for you because you're eating nothing at all, that's the biggest energy you could get if you have some ketones present. You could fast for two days or you could add some ketones in the form of MCT oil in, during a fast. You still get all the metabolic benefits, but what's going on there is your brain feels like you're in a spiritual fast, but you're still working. So there's three different ways to get there. And when you do that, man, you have more energy and you're, you're lit. And, and it, it's so different. So fasting isn't about suffering. Fasting is about actually having more energy. And it's so true. Oh man, the other thing, Derek, I look at return on investment. Like everything you do every day, you're investing energy. I don't mean money, but you invest energy. Because if you don't have energy and you have time, you'll just sleep. And if you don't have energy and you have money, you'll spend all your money to get energy back. So energy is really the currency that matters. And as a guy who had chronic fatigue syndrome and weighed 300 pounds, I really, I feel this. So in the morning, most people wake up and they invest money and time and energy to make breakfast that takes away their energy. Well, I wrote a book on fasting because you spend no money and no time when you skip breakfast and you got more energy back when you do it right. So you actually got paid to fast and you got energy back. So it's the best possible investment because it was cheaper than free. And, and this is why it's so important. But the picture of suffering is not what fasting is about. And you can fast from hate. You can fast from social media. You can fast from junk food. It's called eating healthy. Fast from carbs. It's called keto. Fast from meat. It's called vegan. So fasting is about just going without and feeling safe in your heart that, oh, my body's not going to die. It's going to take me three months to starve to death. I just feel like I'm going to die if I don't have a taco. And then you have to realize how often your body is lying to you and how often it's telling you the truth and sharing wisdom. That's a spiritual fast. And Shaman Durek, what I'm doing that I think your followers would enjoy, I'm leading more than 10,000 people through a training based on fast this way. So when people pick up the book, you go to fastthisway.com, share your receipt. And for the first time ever, I'm actually teaching a book. So two weeks, we can fast in community. I'll teach you the hacks. And these are working fasts. And I'm actually lecturing from the book as a teacher. But then on the final one or two days, we're going to do a spiritual fast altogether, where instead of so, sort of fasting to, to also do my job, we're going to sit down. I'm going to teach some techniques, some breathing and stuff like that. And it's going to be really cool because then you go in and you feel your feelings and you learn how to dial your hunger up and down. And there's so much power in fasting that's easier than what you're doing now. That's why it's there. Fastthisway.com is where people can sign up. No cost. I'm just teaching because I love this. I, I know you do. I know who you are. And I know you, brother. And I love you. And, you know, for me, like being an Omater, the reason why I went to Omod is because when I was eating three meals a day or even two meals a day, I started noticing that my energy wasn't as lit as I wanted it to be. And so I started going into OMOD and I started realizing that my body was eating away all of the toxins in my yeah. system and giving me all of this energy where I can just do like TV interviews, I can write, I can do, I can do healings, I can go on Clubhouse, I can do all of these different things. And it's so amazing. And I wanted you to share with everybody about um, Iftophagy and why it's so important for our health. All right. I'm gonna answer one question along the way to that. Someone's saying, what is OMAD? OMAD is a fancy kind of, kind of Luke Skywalker sounding word for <laughs> I only have one meal a day. It's a one meal a day or a 23 or 24 hour fast, but it sure sounds badass, so I'm You're like, well, yeah, there's nothing, <laughs> yeah, it was nothing like, you know, being at your house and like sitting there and you guys are like trying to serve me food. I'm like, sorry, nope, I only eat one meal. I'll just sit here with you and love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine. Uh, because I have kids, I usually do two meals. But uh, two weeks ago, I fasted for 72 hours. And I was doing six podcast interviews a day on other people's shows, ramping up for the launch of a Fast This Way. And it's huge output to be doing interviews all day. But when your body is, is taught to do this, it's so liberating because you're just in the zone. You're in flow the whole time. And you have the energy. And it's, from, it's coming from within. It didn't come from a burger, right? So what is autophagy? Autophagy is literally self-eating when you go back to what the word comes from. And this is when the body says, I, I don't actually have to use all of my protein digestion power to digest that steak or egg or whatever kind of tofu yeah, uh, that you're actually eating. Tofu is gross. gross. And, and bad gross. for you. Gross, gross. <laughs> so when you, when you do that, um, now it says, well, I 
what am I going to do with all this protein digestion? Oh, maybe I'll break up scar tissue. Maybe I'll break up all this cellular debris that builds up over time. Maybe I'll take out the weak cells and I'll actually grow younger, newer cells. And this is a way to become younger. Fasting, even just for 12 hours a day, ideally you're doing 14, 16, 18, and I talk about the differences. And by the way, you don't have to do the same thing every day. You can, in fact, it works better if you mix up the length of time. But whenever and however you decide to do it, three days a week of 12 plus hours a day will start to turn on the power of autophagy. And if you do a longer one, it works better. What it does, though, is it goes through and it reduces your risks of diabetes, which also reduces your risk of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's. And because you are now metabolically resilient, you can go without, without a physical sense of anxiety. You can digest carbohydrates and you can digest fat for energy. Right now, most people listening, because you, you eat all the time, you actually have plenty of, uh, of carbs in your body. So your body's like, why would I ever burn fat? I don't have to burn fat. But you and I, who've both been very heavy, we both, oh, no, our bodies are trained to burn fat for energy. And when you burn fat for energy, your brain loves it. Your neurons, they, they, they're just requesting fat all the time and they can't get it. So like, I guess I could eat some sugar. But they're like, no, 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 you give me fat. I'm, I'm going to have a brain party up here. And when you have that brain party, I mean, we've talked about this, your ability to access spiritual states goes up because you have more raw energy, more electrons in your brain. When you're doing all that, those extra electrons, that extra energy can also go towards toxin removal, towards the garbage collection process in the body. And you're saying, wait, you mean if I skip breakfast and maybe have a late lunch or an early dinner, all of that's going to happen? Oh, but then I, would, then I would suffer and I'd be really tired and, and all of my energy would be on you know, whatever cookies are there. The whole point of writing fast this way it's, it would have been simple to write a book about fasting. Step one, don't eat for a while. Step two, it's good for you. Here's some study. That's a fasting book. That's not this book. This book is here's the first day I was fasting in a cave. Here's the emotional. Here's the spiritual. Here's the biological. What do we do biologically so that we can show up? You've got a kid on each arm at home, not at school. <laughs> you're trying to pay attention at work, right? And the kid's like, mommy, I want a snack. And, and you're like, how the heck am I going to fast? Cause I got my boss up here on the screen and I've got, you know, just too much going on. And you're, you're very likely to fail in that, but there's some switches you can flip. There's one called ghrelin. There's one called CCK. And one of the fasts or one of the hacks for fasting that's in fast this way has never been talked about in the context of fasting um, ever. And one of them is very well known because people have lost a million pounds on it. And uh, the other one, sometimes people use it. Sometimes people don't, but I want to talk about something called, hair shirt fasting i'm guessing do you know what a hair shirt is no is that something you wore at burning man last year uh no i was wearing much less than a shirt at burning uh, yeah man. i bet you were <laughs> a, a hair shirt is what in the 14th or 15th century um, monks a certain sex of catholicism they would make shirts out of human hair because it's super itchy because suffering is a virtue from that perspective so they'd whip themselves, self-flagellate, and they'd put on a hair shirt, and they'd walk around going, the shirt is so itchy. Every time it's itchy, it's going to remind me of how bad I am. Okay? Yeah. You can do hair shirt fasting, which is basically I'm only going to have water no matter how hungry I am, and I'm just going to feel it. Okay, that's, that might be really good if you're fasting in a cave, right? Or you're really going to go deep, and, and you're going to have that argument with yourself. Do not have the argument with yourself when you're also having an argument with your spouse and your boss. It's stupid, and it creates suffering in your life you don't need. You need metabolism and energy during the week. And when you're going to go and you're going to journal and you're going to be by yourself, you can go for water only or just have some herbal tea or preferably black coffee because black coffee makes fasting work better and work faster than without it. You don't have to do anything any certain way, but at least go 12 hours without eating any protein or any sugar or carbs and you will have achieved a fast even if you ate something. And this makes some, the hair shirt fasters makes them so mad because in studies, mice only had water. Well, in most of most spiritual traditions, when people are doing fasting, they at least is with some sort of tea or something like that. So it doesn't have to be water only. That's an important thing. Yeah, I notice a lot of people do that whole water only situation, which I think is interesting. I wanted to talk about fasting from the perspective of how we've evolved from the time when we were going and hunting one meal, bringing it back to the tribe and then eating that meal and then not eating until we went out and hunt again. Why has it dramatically changed? And how, how, why has people's bodies been 
affect the feel, people feel like I literally hear people say, if I don't eat three meals today, I'm going to die. Like, why have we changed that from the way things used to be to where we are now? Back about 150, 200 years ago, when we first started having factories in England and in the US, uh, you would work 12 to 14 hours without a break, no lunch break, not even a bathroom break. Uh, God knows what was in the soup back then. But it was, it was not a good situation. Let's just put it that way. And so people learned, oh, we've got to eat according to a calendar. And there's train schedules. So we would we'd say, okay, everyone eat at this time, whether you're hungry or not. It's sort of like saying, I'm going to go to the gas station, and we're all going to fill up our gas pump at the same time, whether we need gas or not. It could be spilling out on the ground, but we all must pump our gas at 8 a.m. Monday, Tuesday. It it's, doesn't make sense. But we did it because of convenience. And then we started industrializing our schools. So we put our kids there. So you've got to eat before you go to school. Got to do this. And so it's all regimented. And the problem is that our bodies are elegantly wired to be lazy. Lazy, lazy, lazy in the best possible way. Because why would you spend more energy to stay alive and, re and reproduce the species and do all the things you're here to do than is necessary? And if the body is taught, oh, there's always food around. In fact, you never even get to go without it. It'll say, why would I put energy into making strong, young, highly efficient cells, efficiency is not necessary because there's always donuts. So then the body becomes weak. And when the body becomes weak, it makes less power, less energy, less raw electricity. And when you have less electricity, you have less willpower, you have, you have less energy. And when you decide you want to make yourself a better person, you want to go on a spiritual path, a personal development path, and you can only make half as much energy as you're supposed to be able to, it might be a lot more work. <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, um, I want to talk about how fasting affects mitochondria and how it's um, helping the body on all these different levels. So mitochondria are these ancient bacteria. There's a quadrillion of them studded inside our cells. And they're very interesting because they sense the environment before you do. And then they make a decision based on that. How stressful? How much of a threat? And then they make hormones. They make neurotransmitters. They make raw electricity. They make inflammation. And they do that way before you ever sense anything. And eventually they make a little local decision and a little nerve here. And, and then the nerve electricity travels up to the brain. And then we start throwing it out. Oh, seven levels of the prefrontal cortex. And they're filtering out all the stuff we don't need to know about because it would be overwhelming. That's what mitochondria yeah. are actually doing. And we get this tiny little tip of the iceberg that is our awareness. And it happens later than the mitochondria already felt and sensed and acted. And then we make up a story about what happened there. So mitochondria are way more than power plants. They're sensors that make energy and other stuff dynamically according to the environment that they think they're in, but they suck at thinking. So our job is to think for them and we can do it energetically. We can actually influence them with our thoughts and especially with our emotions and our feelings and our states, but they're always going to be listening to is there a lot of calories in the body right now? What kind of calories are there? What is the light situation? Am I stressed? And is there a tiger out there? All of those are going to go into this beautiful <laughs> equation that happens inside our cells without our knowledge. And what fasting does for mitochondria is they're, they're always making these decisions about how do I save energy? How do I make enough energy for all the stuff I need? Need means live long enough to reproduce and then die and get out of the way. Our job is to trick them and saying, always make the energy of a young person for hundreds of years make all the neurotransmitters, make all the repair stuff that the body needs. You can do that. And when you do that, wow, what's the biggest signal that's going to help them do it? Well, hmm, it looks like the body may not survive, which means we, the mitochondria, who live in and control this body like a big puppet, uh, we might not survive unless we take our weak ones and we sacrifice them and we build young, strong ones. And that's why mitochondria is so important. And that process is called mitophagy. So autophagy is for cleaning up your cells and mitophagy is for taking these little power plants inside the cells going, oh, that power plant, that one's a punk. It's weak. Get rid of it. Make a younger, stronger one. So it's this process of continually upgrading your sensors and your power production because they're the same thing. And imagine what happens. You already know this because you're a shaman. But when you upgrade your sensors, a quadrillion sensors embedded everywhere in the body, what happens? Well, you're more in touch with the world around you. And some of the reasons that you do want to fast, especially on a spiritual fast, like I did in that cave in Sedona, led by a shaman, 
um, for four days where I'm, I'm going to face my fear of being a jerk. I'm going to face my fear of starving to death. And I'm going to face my fear of being alone. <laughs> uh, I'll do all of these and I can, I can just lose it. And what am I going to do? Like pound on the, the wall of the cave that's been used ceremonially for 10,000 years. Like all I'm going to do is get like, like uh, soot on my fist. Like there's no, you know, <laughs> like, like I'm just going to have to own this. Right. And, and I did, but ultimately a lot of the fear did come from mitochondria which is totally crazy, but that's how it works. You know, uh, I wouldn't see you pounding your fist. I mean, I've even done shamanic things with you and you're, you go right into it hundred percent. You're like fully devoted. Like when you go in, you go in. So oh, I do now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about, you know, because in today's culture we have, a really um, difficult situation that's taking place. In shamanism, we believe shamanism is based about having relationship to everything around you, relationship to your body, relationship to your community, relationship to your ancestors and nature, but also relationship to your food that you put in your body. And a lot of people have negative relationships to food. And the way that they build their relationships with food isn't always the best and can lead to mental health decline and all types of inflammation that can lead to autoimmune disease and so much. So why, what is, how does fasting help people build a better relationship to food? Mm, I, I just love this question. No one's asked that question that way. So you know me. Yeah, it's, it's such, a, such a powerful thing. When I was overweight, I would say, today I'm not going to eat junk food. And then someone would put a cookie in front of me. And here's the inner dialogue of a cookie when your mitochondria are weak. Okay, the cookie says, eat me. And you say, are you kidding? Like, I'm Dave, I'm strong. I'm not going to eat the cookie. And then about oh, five seconds later, the cookie says, eat me. Okay, these are thoughts that keep arising. These are thoughts caused by my mitochondria going, don't you know, you could, there could be a famine. You got to eat the cookie. All right, so then... I go, no. And then it says, eat me. No. And anyone who has ever seen a two-year-old, the two-year-old will pester the parents until they get candy. And eventually I'm like, I am, I'm trying to pay attention to this meeting. The cookie has all of my thoughts. I'm just going to eat half the cookie. All right. And as soon as I eat it, I go, God, I'm such a loser. Like, like what, why did I do that? Well, since I'm already a loser, I might as well have the rest of the cookie. Right. And then like, I'm even more of a loser. Right. And what's going on there is the cookie had power because your cells didn't have power. And when you learn fasting, it gives your cells power. So it, the next time you look at the cookie, instead of the cookie going, eat me, you look at the cookie and you go, I'm not hungry. And you just look away and there's no more thoughts about the cookie. Your thoughts stay on track. They stay on you know, teaching two plus two equals four to your kids, or they, they stay on whatever you're looking to do right there. Or maybe they stay on your meditation. It, it, it doesn't really matter, but they stayed on because it took the power from the food and put it back in your cells. And if there's emotional eating or boredom eating, fasting is also going to give you, especially in a spiritual fast, um, the ability to examine, geez, I know I'm not hungry right now because I've learned intermittent fasting and I know the sensation of hunger versus a craving. And hmm, why do I want to do that? But now instead of saying, why do I want to do it and sort of mindlessly doing it, you've got the extra power. So you can go, hmm, it looks like I probably have an issue. I might want to do some work on there. And then you can go figure out what it is, whether you go down a spiritual path on it, you go to a psychologist, you do EMDR, you do neurofeedback, you do some breathing exercises, drink some water. But instead of it being about denial and shame and guilt, it simply comes about, my body is telling me to eat, but I know my body isn't ready for food right now. And one of the things that's been part of my path for quite a while now is uh, one of these guys. This is a continuous glucose monitor. And that allows me to wave my phone over that little puck. It's from Levels Health. And then you look at your phone and it tells you your blood sugar levels. So if I'm like, man, I'm really hungry right now and my blood sugar is 110, I'm like, Wait, there's plenty of fuel running through my blood, but my body is telling me there isn't. That means I gave myself a craving instead of actual hunger, right? And just that knowledge can, can let you go, oh, I think I'll wait a little while. I wonder what I did. And then you realize, hmm, whatever I ate in my last meal caused a craving. Oh, that really bad sleep I had last night, that caused a craving. And all of a sudden, you start becoming in charge of your cravings. And you start realizing that hunger is not the same as a craving. When I was fat, I had never experienced hunger because I only experienced cravings because I didn't know how to eat. Yeah, I, I definitely would say so. I, I wanted to, to, um, to ask, when, when it comes to fasting, and, and, this is, and this is more of a spiritual question for you, Dave, you know, a lot of people are wondering, 
when you fast, how does it support your spiritual, evol- your, your spiritual evolution and your upgrade spiritually by fasting? Can you talk about that? Um, how does fasting upgrade your spiritual practice? And your so, spiritual evolution, yeah, your spiritual, spiritual mindset. Evolution. Part of it is that fasting will give you knowledge of the voice in, in your head. And remember, there's those, those three big voices that are responsible for everything we've ever done that we're ashamed of. It basically it came down to fear, which drives procrastination. Um, it drives avoidance. It drives uh, uh, negative responses and criticism. And it, it drives unkindness, right? And what happens is the body feels fear because, oh, there might be a threat here, even though there's not. And then you make up a story. Oh, that other person was mean to me. It turns out they really weren't mean to you. Your body felt afraid. You needed to find a cause for that feeling of anxiety. And it was that person, even though it probably wasn't really. So you, you can start to unpack that. And then clearly the food thing. And then the other F word that we talked about, all of those three things, everything we've ever done that we're ashamed of came from ancient survival behaviors that we took ownership of. And you do own them because it's your body doing it. But when you recognize the true source of those things, now for spiritual evolution, you can say, aha, I thought it because I was a bad person. And now you realize it's because my body was programmed to do this and the programming sucked. I'm going to use a spiritual practice to go in and reprogram my body to behave in a better way for my community and for the world in which I actually live versus the world that is trying to survive in. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so tell me about um intermittent fasting and also give a little bit of information about omad so people know the difference yes so intermittent fasting starts at 12 hours i mean it's 12 hours without eating and you can have a 12 hour eating window and for some people that's actually right uh, especially women there's a whole chapter in the book for women where uh, doing OMAD for women, especially on their cycle, is usually much more difficult. So women oftentimes need a slightly gentler fasting regimen than men. Otherwise, they run into a wall uh, first. So it starts at 12 hours, and a common entry-level fast is 14 hours. And you're going, 14 hours? It's not that hard. Have dinner a little bit early. Finish dinner like around 6, okay? You get four hours till bedtime. That's four hours. You sleep for eight hours. That was 12 hours. There you did it. <laughs> Have a late breakfast. Okay, 14 hours is really easy. It, it basically involves pushing breakfast out a little bit. You can do it. If you have dinner at 9 p.m., it's a little different, but having an earlier dinner is really good anyway. Then you get into a 16-8, which is really common, probably the most common, where that means 16 hours you don't eat, and you eat a normal amount of food as much as is necessary, as much as you want for that eight hours. And then when you get a little bit beyond that, you go, I only have to wait another couple more hours. Let me go to an 18-6, which means I went 18 hours of the day without food. And then you ate for six hours. And that's really where most people end up. And some days, I don't recommend doing it every day the way you do, although for you it works. You're an outlier. Some days you go, you know what? I already went 18 hours. If I just skip lunch, I'll have done a 24-hour fast. Like, how epic is that? but you're kind of tricking yourself to just skip lunch. It's not that big of a deal. It's, it's like just adding a little bit more on. And when you do that, you've now achieved OMAD, which is one meal a day. And it's entirely possible. And in fact, it's good for you uh, to go, at least to do it sometimes, maybe not all the time, especially if your metabolism isn't strong yet, uh, to just say, oh, I just ate once a day. And if you want to be really cool about it, uh, you actually eat that meal around two o'clock. So yep. you have like a giant lunch, and then you're good to go. And if you wait at least three hours and ideally four or even five hours after your last meal before you sleep, you'll get much better sleep, which is super cool. So you can start to dial it in. And the reason that 2 p.m. is the best time to eat, even though 5 p.m. is fine uh, or 6 p.m., whatever, but 9 p.m. is not, is because we go back to our roots. Two billion years ago, ancient bacteria floating in the ocean that became the puppet masters of us. And when they're floating in the ocean, it's nighttime, it gets cold, they sink down, and they rest and recover. And then the sun comes up at an angle, and it's red and yellow light. They pick that up, go, oh, it must be morning, and it starts to get warmer. And then all the the bacteria or all the algae that they're eating starts to flourish at noon when the sun's overhead. And you get the most of of that food source available between about noon and two. And then the sun starts to go down the algae is growing a little bit less, and then you get more red light, and then it gets cool. We are so welded to that cycle. Light is a stronger signal 
for our circadian biology, for our sleeping than anything else. And food is the second strongest signal. And there's a chapter in the book where I'm like, here's how to use fasting plus light to not have jet lag, to become a morning person if you've never been a morning person in your life. I can tell you my natural bedtime is 2.04 a.m. and has been since I was 10 years old. My normal bedtime now is 10.30 because I dropped my son off at school today or at the bus stop is, you know, 7 whatever, 7.15. And if I had to go to bed at two and wake up at 7.15 every day, I would hate my life. So I changed my sleep cycle by changing when I eat and my light exposure. But either one alone isn't strong enough. See, there's stuff in the book about how to use this so that you control your biology by changing the signal it gets. Because they're, they're bacteria, they're dumb, you can trick them. And you can trick them with exercise, you can trick them with temperature, you can trick them with food and with light. But 2 p.m. is when they want to eat. And if they get that at two and they get some sunlight in the middle of the day, like, I got it. All your liver, your pancreas, all of your organs, your skin, your brain, your eyes, they all line up and they all do the right thing at the right time because they got a signal for when it was. And you're going to sleep like a great golden god. And you're going to wake up and you're going to feel really good. And now everything's aligned. But when we're trying to do a spiritual practice and some parts of our body think it's nighttime, some parts think it's 10 p.m., some people think it's 10 a.m. or some parts think you get a jumbled energy and you can overcome that but it's subtle, but it is, it is a lack of alignment. And if you are going to create a very altered, very powerful spiritual state, you actually want to create alignment and circadian alignment of light and food together matters. So do your OMAD at 2 p.m. or closer to that, and you'll get better results in your spiritual practice as well as in your metabolism. Yeah, that's exactly when I do it. And the reason why I do it is, is because that's when the pitifier and the Agne is much more responsive in the body. So the body's like, okay, I'm ready to, to heat up. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm in pitta mode. Whereas uh, towards the end of the evening, we go into kapha and the body's like, I'm, I'm shutting down. Why are you putting food on me? Why are you asking me to turn on the fire? That, the kitchen is closed. And I always, I always, I always have that, that vision in my head that like when the sun is going down, the cooks start cleaning up the kitchen, the, the fires are turning off, and they're like, okay, we're closed, we'll see you early, 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 you know? Yeah. And, and so that's how I, I, I gauge the pizza. So for me, eating at that time allows my body to stay lit, and then when it starts going down, because if I eat, I've noticed that if I eat anything at coffee, which I don't, but let's say I did, then everything starts go. I start feeling sluggish, and then the next day I feel horrible. And yes. so really getting out of that, out of that, out of that space and really coming into a, a deeper space with my body. I, I want to go into um, um, when it comes into women and understanding women is women is, is it safe for women to fast and what are your thoughts about it? And what have you heard? It is 100% safe for women to fast and it is not safe for women or men to over fast. And women are more susceptible to overfasting. And what this means is that for, for the studies I went through, only about a third of studies are on women. And the rest of them are just on men. And that's mostly because a lot of studies were done on college students. And throughout most of the history of college, it was pretty much white dudes <laughs> that were in college. So now yeah. we have a lot more diversity. We have more women than men in college. So a newer study that relies on college students is going to be more balanced, but an older one isn't. And also oftentimes pilot studies are just done on men because they're saying, well, we're going to do six of them, but the big study on a thousand people is going to be half men and women, but we just needed a small sample to show no one would die. I guess it's okay to let the men die. I don't really know. But what they, uh, <laughs> uh, what they're, what they're doing there is they're showing, okay, for women, um, fasting definitely provides metabolic benefits, lots of them. And women get two thirds of Alzheimer's disease. In other words, they get twice as much Alzheimer's disease as men and high blood sugar is a major cause of that. So there's some big reasons for women to do intermittent fasting. And what I recommend in the chapter in Fast This Way, by the way, if you guys are just joining, we're talking about my brand new book, Fast This Way. Um, what it turns out you should start with is three intermittent fasts a week. So do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing and do it for four to six weeks. And you might try OMAD on one of those days. You might try a 12 hour fast. And if you're on your cycle or just right before your cycle, you might not wanna fast, or you might just do a 12 hour fast instead of an 18 hour fast. Because the body is looking at fasting as a physiological stress. And there are other times when you have enough physiological stress in your body anyway. And 
over fasting for women, the first symptom is your sleep quality declines. The second symptom is you start getting irregular cycles. And the third symptom is you start getting uh, less hair, you get hair shedding. And so many women are like, I felt so good when I intermittent fasted. Finally, I'm free of all the toxins in my weird kale, quinoa, tofu, garbage breakfast, whatever the heck you thought was good for you. Um, <laughs> you're, you're doing that and, and wow, I feel amazing. So I'm gonna do this every day. But then four or six weeks later, you know, I already know fasting makes me feel good, but I'm not feeling as good as I was. I must need to fast more to turn it back on. And that's what I call the fasting trap. So for women, I'm like, look, if things aren't normal, back off a little bit. And for guys, it takes us usually about six or eight weeks before we will hit a fasting trap. And the first thing is our sleep quality goes down. Then we wake up without a kickstand. And you guys know what I'm talking about. And then you go uh, from there, you also start getting thinning hair. And, and so we both get hormonal irregularities. We get sleep quality issues and we get issues with hair, but they happen at different times. And this is because of evolutionary biology. So for women, start out with three, see how it works, do it for six or eight weeks. That will cause your body to start shifting. You'll, you'll become less insulin resistant. You'll get better metabolism. You'll start feeling really good. And then you say, oh, I'm going to make them longer fast or I'll do four times a week. Honestly, though, I recommend Saturday or Sunday morning, have brunch. Right. Even have some have some pancakes, just make them gluten free. And you do that to teach your body that the world isn't predictable and it should be ready to not be predictable. And plus, it's nice to have brunch with friends or something like that. You don't have to be a purist all the time. So every now and then don't go out and have pizza, beer, nachos and wreck yourself for a week with inflammation. But you can go out and say, you know, I'm going to have the maple syrup. It's OK, because I taught my metabolism to handle it. And I'm doing it only occasionally. And I'm having some sugar. You don't have to be zero carb when you're fasting. In fact, for women especially, it's not necessary. Have your carbs at night. You're eating normally during your eating window. So fasting works with any diet. It works better if you don't eat foods that cause cravings. And uh, that's kind of a summary of what it is for women. But you pay attention to the time of the month and you pay attention to not over fasting and you start out slowly to see how you, you deal with it. And on a day where you're going, I feel like garbage. I'm dizzy. I have low blood pressure. I think I might be getting a migraine. Like, dude, go eat. It's okay. You didn't fail on your fast. You converted your OMAD fast into a 14 hour fast because that's what your body wanted. And that's just called kindness to yourself. So how does it affect women who are um, breastfeeding? Don't fast if you're breastfeeding. Just straight up. You might say, I'm going to have a later breakfast if that's what your body wants. Don't force yourself to eat if, you're, if you just don't want it. But generally when you're breastfeeding, you're going to be pretty ravenous. Now, my first book was on fertility. I, I designed the program that helped my wife, who's a medical doctor, become fertile when she was 39 and 42. And, and you basically sure did. Her her kids. You sure so I'm, did. I'm all about that question for sure. Breast milk production takes so much work. And when you fast, you start burning your fat reserves that oftentimes have extra toxins in them. So what you want to be doing is eating a lot of clean fat, grass-fed butter, MCT oil, by the way, up to 17% of the fat that's in breast milk is brain octane oil, the same exact type of fat that's in there, the C8 MCT that I make for Bulletproof. So that's because babies' brains love ketones. So what you want to do then is don't eat sugar, don't eat junk food uh, when you're nursing. But fasting is not a good idea. Maybe a 12-hour fast, but you might even turn off milk production if you start fasting for longer periods of time. So treat yourself amazingly well. Collagen, um, eating grass-fed whatever, in, in grass-fed liver is really good for you. It tastes gross. You can take capsules. Um, all those sorts of things. So high nutrient, high energy, you know, like, hey, body, make the best milk on earth, and you'll have a healthier, stronger baby for life, and their children will be stronger when you do that. So you're doing that for a year or two of breastfeeding, but it is a multi-generational gift you're giving your kids. Beautiful. You know, a lot of people don't know about your fertility book, and I just want to thank you you know, being your friend for a very long time, uh, what all the research and all the love that you put in to researching everything around that for Lana so that she can, and you have the most beautiful children. I love your family so much. And I love how you're always going in and finding information and doing your due diligence so that you can make it easier for other people. So I'm just really happy. I'm really happy that we're brothers and that we're friends and we're such kooky, kooky nerds together. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too, Derek. I, I'm just hanging out with you. We've got to get all this air travel fixed so we can, we can go party somewhere and uh, stay up late and not eat. It'll be great fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
I'm seeing a bunch of questions on here. Guys, I don't think yeah, we so have I'm time to answer all the questions, but go to fastestway.com, send your receipt to me. I'll spend two weeks teaching this to you. A video every morning, three live Q and A's like this, talking only about fasting, a community of 10,000 plus people, all doing it at the same time, all sharing knowledge, no cost. Just pick up the book and I'm gonna be there for you for two straight weeks, starting the third week of January. So order your book, Fastest Way, right now. Bonus points if you get it from a small publisher or a small bookstore, I mean, um, or get it wherever you like to get it. And I would love to see you and answer every question you have about fasting together. And thank you, Shaman Durek, for having me on. Oh, I love you, Dave, so much. Can we answer at least two questions or do you not yeah. have any more time? Yeah, Is that we, cool? we can do it. Yeah, we have like two more minutes at most. Because I, I, know, how, I know how you are with your time, with your time crunches. Yep. Pick, pick a couple questions. Uh, you go for it. Audible's good. People are asking that. Audible or Kindle or print is, is fine. Can you safely fast when you have adrenal fatigue? Yes, you can. If you're in stage four adrenal fatigue, you probably want to start out by having protein and fat in the morning. And you definitely don't want to be in keto if you have adrenal fatigue. You can have ketones present with MCT oil, but you're probably going to want to go for more a 12 or a 14 hour fast not super long fasts, but if you are in adrenal fatigue and you never get rid of all the cellular garbage because you're in adrenal fatigue, you're gonna be caught in a trap where you eat all the time because you have adrenal fatigue and then you can never have a chance to heal. Just, they don't need to be long ones. Oh, this is, I am insulin resistant and female. What would you recommend? Well, you definitely wanna read Fast This Way because I talk a lot about insulin resistance. So what you start out with if you especially have a few pounds to lose, usually that's the case. If it's 20 plus <clears throat> pounds, when you start out, you can turn on your leptin sensitivity, make yourself more sensitive to ghrelin as well. And what you do for that is you say, okay, I'm going to start out the morning for the first at least couple of weeks, maybe even the first month with only fat and protein. And you do this because having 30 plus grams of protein when you first wake up will kickstart your insulin sensitivity. And from there, you go into intermittent fasting every other day. And when you do every other day like that, the other mornings, it's protein and fat. And the easiest way to do protein and fat is you put two scoops of collagen protein in a bulletproof coffee and you got the perfect fat, you got the perfect stuff. You don't have to do it that way. And it won't change my life if you do, but I've helped people lose a million pounds and that's how I do it. So I'm just recommending it because I know it works. Dave, you're the best. I love you so much. Please go out and get his book fast this way. Also, Dave, I'm on Clubhouse. I think we should do some talks on Clubhouse together. Please don't forget to follow me on Clubhouse so we can. I, I will do so on Clubhouse too. I think I'm probably Dave Asprey on Clubhouse, I, I would guess. I think you are. So we can, uh, so we can open up some, uh, some conversations on, on optimization and fasting and all this good stuff. I yeah. love you so much, brother. Give the family my love, love and thank you so much for being on this planet. Uh, and thank you, brother. We'll see each other soon. Bye, yes, everybody. We will. That was an amazing and wonderful discussion with lovely and powerful and insightful and well researched Dave Asprey. And it is so wonderful to be able to have my brother, who I've been friends with for a very long time, to share his new book, Fastest Way. So please get a chance go out and get yourself a copy. And if you haven't got a copy of Spirit Hacking, he also wrote the forward to my book, Spirit Hacking, and please get that too. Those two books will definitely allow you to navigate what's going on on the planet and be able to keep yourself healthy and also keep yourself spiritually well. I love you so much and remember how powerful you are. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you for showing up for these conversations and being able to keep yourself lit by getting the information by experts that I bring on here on Instagram Live so that we can have wonderful talks and get down to the nitty gritty of what we need in order to be sustainable human beings. And until next time, I will see you all later. Love you.